Hello, hello, and welcome to the Physionic Dedicated Podcast. My name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I am a current student, current PhD student in molecular medicine, and I hold a master's in exercise physiology. All right, today I wanted to, I was really thinking about what I wanted to talk about because I do like to make these podcast episodes more off the cuff. I have incredibly bare notes in front of me as I kind of go through them. And I had a few different topics written down if you'd like to hear just my kind of unfiltered thoughts on a particular topic, then you are certainly welcome to contact me and I would be happy to just sit down and talk for a little bit about a topic that you would like to hear my opinion on, if I am so bold. So uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about mitochondria, which is something I've done quite a bit of actual research on, not just reading literature, but actually uh, doing the research itself in terms of being in the lab, uh, looking at cells uh, in animal work as well. So I've done uh, research looking at oxidative phosphorylation, as well as citrate synthase assays, which means it's a fancy way of saying that I'm looking at particular aspects of mitochondria. And my master's thesis was on mitochondrial work. Now, uh, in the lab that I'm working in right now, we also do mitochondrial work, extremely heavy mitochondrial work, and that's more looking at mechanisms of mitochondria. So I thought, you know, the, the organelle of the mitochondria is actually incredibly interesting. Uh, a lot of my friends <laughs> like to make fun of me for, for being so mitochondria-focused. I don't really have a strong attachment to the organelle, but it is an interesting organelle, and I haven't really spoken about it in in all that much depth. So I wanted to take a moment and talk about specifically a process that happens uh, with our mitochondria, and that process is fission and fusion. So when you think of uh, like if you were to talk to a physicist, you might have fission and fusion in terms of like nuclear reactors. I know nothing about that. I'm going to talk about the biological concept of mitochondrial fission and mitochondrial fusion. So let's talk a little bit about what mitochondria do. Obviously we know, oh man, from every single cell biology course that you've taken, every single just general biology course that you've ever taken, all the way in middle school most likely, you had your teacher tell you that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And that's absolutely right. It's not incorrect in any way, but it certainly does a lot more than just that. So yes, mitochondria do produce adenosine triphosphate, which is predominantly the uh, energy currency of the cell. They actually also create GTP, which is uh, the other form of currency that our cells use, and we use other for- forms of currency as well. Those can also be attributed to mitochondria, but just in general, just know the mitochondria does produce a massive amount of energy. So that allows our cells to stay alive, and it does that by converting lipids as well as glucose through aerobic glycolysis and the other one, well, I guess both of them end up going through what's called oxidative phosphorylation. And lipids go through beta oxidation and then go through oxidative phosphorylation. I'm saying a bunch of fancy names. Essentially, all I'm saying is that they create ATP. You can use carbohydrates or you can use fats. That's it. That's all I really need you to know. Okay, what, 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 what else do mitochondria do, though? They create signaling molecules. So they send out signals through this production of free radicals. So you've heard of uh, reactive oxygen species. You've heard that they're all negative, and that is incorrect. Uh, We actually do, our cells have adapted to a point where they can use a little bit of those reactive oxygen species, which has been attributed to cancer, has been attributed to a series of different diseases, but a little bit of of them, just a few of those molecules can actually be helpful because they allow us to signal to other parts of the cell that we need the recruitment of different other things. So it just essentially propagates a signal. So a certain low level amount of reactive oxygen species is perfectly acceptable and probably wanted. So the mitochondria allow that. They also do the opposite. So they actually allow for the neutralization of, neutralizing of 
the free radicals or reactive oxygen species. So if you have too many, they can also control the levels uh, that do that through what's called the glutathione pathway and other pathways as well, but that's probably the most uh, talked about one. So can eliminate through, uh, well, you've heard of antioxidants, so similar system. So being able to eliminate those reactive oxygen species if they get too high. And the final thing I want to touch on in terms of what the mitochondria do is they propagate cell death. So uh, if you have no energy in your cells and your cells are living organisms, uh, well, they're not organisms, but they're living, uh, then that would mean that if you eliminate the energy, then that's like if we were to take all food out of your home and tell you you can't eat for 10 years. You're not going to live. <laughs> that's the bottom line. You're not going to live. That's exactly what happens. If you were to eliminate the mitochondria, then you would not live, or at least not the cells would not live for very long. And that is part, there is an apo, a mitochondrial apoptosis, meaning cell death dependent pathway. So uh, a pathway by which cells die that are dependent on the destruction of the mitochondria. So the cell will either receive a signal or before or tells itself, we need to destroy the mitochondria. And when it does that, then it leads to cell death. Makes sense. So... As you can see, the mitochondria do a number of different things. Now, what's interesting, what it, so the, beyond that, uh, the mitochondria also contain about 1% of your DNA, which is really interesting because most people think of the nucleus as the area that we contain our DNA, and that is largely correct. So 99% of our DNA is kept, our genes, our genome is kept in our cell's nucleus. However, there are just a few strands of DNA that are kept in the mitochondria. And those encode for particular proteins that get integrated into the mitochondria. But what's interesting is that while the nucleus has this robust system of checking your genome, it's constantly checking your genome, it's constantly making sure that you're not getting any sort of faulty mutations that, are, that could lead to cancer or could lead to the cell dying. Uh, which would probably be preferable over cancer because you'd rather have a cell die than for it to proliferate or to grow into uh, cancer. But that's beside the point. Still, you don't have any checkpoints really in the mitochondria. So that genome can be mutated very quickly. Uh, there are no ways for your cells to check the genome and then repair that genome. So what do they do? And that's where mitochondrial fission and fusion come in. So in a situation where you have a mitochondria, because you're going to have many mitochondria across your cells, unless you're maybe talking about muscle cells, which have more of a lattice structure of mitochondria. But if you think of like the bean-shaped mitochondria, which is the one that's usually presented in textbooks, if you have many of them in one cell, uh, if a few of them start having mutations in their DNA, which is bound to happen to all of them eventually, but it's going to happen to a few of them initially, then what you can have is uh, mitochondrial fusion in which a healthy mitochondrion will essentially open and bind to an unhealthy mitochondrion. And the reason why I would want to do that is because we think because we want to dilute the DNA, so the bad DNA from the good DNA. And if we can dilute that, then uh, that's going to generally still keep a viable mitochondrion. So you're gonna have a larger, of course, a much larger mitochondrion, and that's going to be able to then still be functional. So that would be the main reason why you would want to have fusion. Also, if you just want to combine two smaller mitochondrions, two perfectly healthy mitochondrions into a larger mitochondrion, that may, be, may increase the efficiency. Now, in terms of fission, that would be the splitting apart of mitochondria. So fusion is the combination of mitochondria. The fission is the splitting apart of mitochondria. And usually what happens is you get this pinching of, let's say, a large mitochondria. And it, what it does is it reorganize. It can actually reorganize where that genome, genome is kept. And it will pinch off parts 
of itself to a point where you have a smaller mitochondrion and a larger mitochondrion. So obviously still smaller than the original, but larger than uh, than the, the, the part that's been pinched off. So the part that's been pinched off is typically the part that contains a lot of mutated DNA. So why would you want to do that? Because then eventually that's going to get fused into a different mitochondria, and then you're still in the exact same situation. Well, not quite. Uh, in that situation, if you have this fission occur, uh, what you'll find is that there's autophagy, and you're probably familiar with that through my videos or through some other site or whatever it might be. You've probably heard of autophagy, but autophagy is a cleanup system of your cells and without it then your cells would most likely die uh, because they need to be constantly replenished and get rid of broken uh, or misfolded proteins things of that nature but autophagy can specifically target mitochondria especially uh, mutated mitochondria that aren't functioning correctly or will not be functioning correctly uh, in the near future and will envelop them and destroy them and then essentially, in a manner of speaking, poop out the, the, the small bits that we can still use, and then the cell will then reincorporate those bits into other proteins, just something else in the cell. We'll just recycle that system. And that process is not called autophagy, it's called, fittingly, it's called mitophagy. So the enveloping of a small mitochondrion, destroying it, and then getting the kind of the small parts like destroying a house, getting the parts of that house and rebuilding a new house uh, right beside that, that location that you initially destroyed it. So in those ways, now hopefully you feel a little more educated on mitochondria, what they do, they certainly provide energy, but they don't just do that, and how mitochondrial dynamics work. So how mitochondrial fission and fusion occur and why they occur. All right, with that said, hopefully it was informative. And if it was, then I hope that I have the pleasure of speaking with you in the next one. Have a good one, guys. Bye.